Are you angry? I hope you are frigging angry. We hold the power to change the political calculus in America. 5% of the global population is indigenous peoples, but we protect and steward 80% of the world's biodiversity. The answers to this crisis are right in front of us. It is a life in balance, not a life of greed. Rise up and stand with the original caretakers of these lands, the indigenous people. We're gonna go raise a ruckus. There's about 25 of us inside the J.P. Morgan Chase Bank branch, and this really marks the escalation of Fire Drill Fridays. We are lucky to be alive during a time of great social upheaval and change. The systems behind the climate crisis were built by and for a powerful minority. They will be rebuilt by and for an even more powerful majority. We must be in solidarity. See you next time. Welcome everybody and thank you for joining us for our Fire Drill Friday rally because it's the first Friday in August. Over these last months, you know, I've, I've talked a lot about the importance of people power, how we, we have to hang together and, and take action together. You see, people taking action together is the only thing that has ever bent the arc of history in a more just direction. You've also heard me mention on several occasions how studies have shown that to win policy chains, you only need three and a half percent of the people to be with you, which is in, in the United States is 11 million people. Now, Tony Lacerowitz, a senior research scientist at the Yale Program on Climate Change Communications, says that 25 million Americans are alarmed by climate change but they aren't, they aren't organized. They haven't been asked to step into climate activism, you know, to, to do something about it. Lacerowitz also says that 13 million Americans say they would engage in civil disobedience. So you see, there's a huge yet untapped potential out there, right? I mean, 11 million people is, is nothing if we're organized and reaching out to the great unasked and ask them to join. And that's why I and the Fire Drill Friday team and Greenpeace are so excited that so many people are following us. One million people in July alone, over 400,000 last Friday. Um, many of you have become really long timers ever since last fall in DC. You know, I see your names. You've been with us every, every single Friday from the very beginning. But I'm also getting emails and blog posts like this one. She said that she's found a renewed sense of purpose through volunteering with Fire Drill Fridays and participating in protests. And then I, I got another one saying, quote, since Fire Drill Fridays, I've done so many things that surprised me. I feel I have more confidence. I'm sticking up for myself at work and with family, unquote. <laughs> Isn't that great? See, I think it has to, well, part of it has to do with feeling that you're part of a community, all working for a common goal. We like to feel part of, of a community. And the fact that you're taking actions that are aligned with your hopes and values. Over decades of activism, I found that taking action for what you believe in is the best antidote to depression. Now, the closer that you follow broad climate movements, the more you become aware of the amazing but often unheralded victories that have been won by people who are well-organized, motivated with a clear strategy for winning. You know, that's what I love about my Greenpeace Fire Drill team. They know how to win. They're very strategic. 
and they've put into place a broad plan for winning in November and continuing beyond. And I really want to stress that, the continuing beyond part, because it's, it's important for all of us to know that if our side wins in November, please, goddess, the work, the protests, the pressure cannot let up. You know, the other day, Annie Leonard said to me, um, she described what happened when Obama was elected. She said, we went from being a movement to being at the movies, you know, kind of sitting back and saying, oh, look what he's doing now. Oh my gosh, I wonder how this is going to turn out. No, yet. Being a bystander to history simply won't cut it. There's going to have to be a lot of, of holding feet to fire. Too much is at stake, a livable planet to start with. It's going to take a lot of organizing, and we need you. We need you to stick with it after November, after the inauguration for that matter, and for however long it takes to make sure that what needs to happen has happened. We cannot allow business as usual to reign, right? We've all, we've all been given a stark wake-up call, letting us know what a disaster business as usual is for the majority of Americans. We need big, bold, sweeping actions and policies that can repair what's broken, put millions of people to work in safe green jobs that allow workers to support a family, buy a home, and, and feel secure. So much needs to be done to slow the climate crisis and make this country resilient. And the process of doing all this has to live up, lift up the communities and people who for so many decades, centuries, have been on the front line of environmental and economic racism. Study the, green, study the New Deal, you know, the one back in, in the 1930s during the Great Depression when Franklin Delano Roosevelt was president. Study that to see what big, bold actions look like. Actions taken despite all kinds of fierce attacks from the wealthy and powerful. Actions that succeeded because of massive organized public pressure. This is another major historic moment of crisis when people power is needed to save our planet and our democracy. This is more consequential than any previous crisis because of what the fossil fuel industry has done to us. We need people, we need organizers. See, without organizers, we can't build power. And without power, we can't dismantle structural racism and end white supremacy and address climate change and climate crisis. Today, we're gonna to celebrate some organizers and learn how they achieved their victories. It's impossible not to notice how so many climate victories are led by indigenous peoples, the peoples who have inhabited this land long before any of us ever, ever arrived here. This is true here in the United States and all over the world. Last Friday, we, we learned that we have to protect the rights of the Amazon's indigenous people if we want to save the forests. See, indigenous peoples have a sacred connection to land and water and are willing to risk everything to protect them. Using their bodies to block pipelines, indigenous peoples have saved pristine boreal forests and species diversity in British Columbia, Alberta, Canada, and all over the US. And now you're gonna find out about those and other victories from some of the bravest and most persistent frontline warriors. And to start us off, I want to introduce Donna Chavis, a member of the Lumbi tribe who lives in Pembroke, North Carolina. She graduated from the University of North Carolina at Pembroke, a historic Indian American university, and she's an environmental and social justice act activist. Throughout her 40 years of advocacy, Donna has ensured that the interests of indigenous peoples have been represented. She was a member of the planning committee of the first National People of Color Leadership Summit and co-founded the Center for Community Action, a 38-year-old multicultural social justice advocacy nonprofit. 
Don is a senior fossil fuels campaigner at Friends of the Earth US. And in 2016, she created the Red-Tailed Hawk Collective to work primarily with indigenous and other impacted communities along the route of the proposed Atlantic Coast Pipeline. For years, Donna has led the fight to stop that pipeline, and she'll tell us today how that turned out. Please welcome Donna Shabas. Thank you, Jane and Nemosa. It is so good to be with you and everybody else today. Um, and yes, I am Donna Chavis, daughter of Harvard and Gertrude and granddaughter of Zimmy Chavis. I'm a grateful Lumbee elder, one, woman, mother, and grandmother. And first, I must acknowledge the ancestors who came before me and on whose land we stand today. It is those ancestors who prepared the way for all and laid the groundwork for what is to come. For that, we are grateful and call out our appreciation. You know, today is a good day, Jane. Uh, you just brought back so many memories uh, as you were talking. I was thinking about being a part of the Toxic Wasted Race uh, report that came out in 1987. And as you said, this is not a short journey. This is a, a lifetime um, effort. It's one that um, it's the journey, not just the destination. It's all of it. Being born a Lumbee woman, I'm born an environmentalist. First and foremost, we are taught from birth um, in the way that we are treated and cared for, that we are to also care for others and especially our earth. The earth is the first, first mother. And of course, mothers are the first environmentalists because they carry children inside them in their womb then they need to be ready for that responsibility. And so today, part of what we're doing is reflecting, celebrating, and seeing about moving forward. Like you said, this is not the end. This is the beginning that keeps starting over and over again. Um, even when we clear out all fossil fuels, we'll need to continue. So we're going to reflect on how we got to this point and celebrate the end of the Atlantic Coast Pipeline and move forward with renewed strength and determination. Now, I found that the Atlantic Coast Pipeline in some ways was a, a fossil fuel project that was for its size, for its size, it was kind of going on under the radar and with an awful lot of help from um, regulators and decision makers and politicians, all of that can be documented. I won't do that today, but it was really part of the effort that we had to do was get to word the word out there. And so today I'll say, what is the ACP? What was the ACP? For those who may not be familiar with it, the Atlantic Coast Pipeline was a proposed 604 mile frack gas pipeline that would have started in West Virginia, went through Virginia, and then through North Carolina. Uh, Dominion Energy and Duke Energy were the primary owners of the pipeline. In the project and those are two of the largest in any given day Dominion and Engine, Dominion and Duke are the largest um, investor owned utility in the country and they were moving ahead with this thing starting in 2013 and then ending in 2020 um, with very little notice I mean things were getting decided before it was even made public that this project was moving forward. So the work was cut out, cut out for us all along the way. Um, and you might notice that I get more excited as I talked about it because with all of the power that was behind this effort, the power of the people was so much greater. I mean, it was just, I can just think about it. And when I talk about it, the energy begins to flow through me. And so many of the efforts were led by the indigenous peoples in North Carolina and Virginia. So this was an unnecessary env environmental bomb just waiting to happen. And the 600 miles um, that the pipeline would have gone through snaked its way through. Uh, and it really was a form of a snake because it was not the shortest route from West Virginia to North Carolina. Most of the communities were indigenous, black and other peoples of color. And often they were also low wealth. So the picture of this demographic the demographic picture of this pipeline was a poster child. You know, going forward in history, um, this could be the poster child for environmental injustices. And Duke and Dominion caused an awful lot of trouble along the way. 
And so we had the people who were most impacted had to get in its way. So the pipeline was scheduled to end in Pembroke, North Carolina, which is the ancestral home of the Lumbee, my people. Um, but along the way, over 30,000 indigenous peoples from multiple native nations were in the impact zone. Along North Carolina route alone, over 30,000. And yet when they did their study, that was not considered a disproportionate impact. And so, you know, that was something that we had to take on and challenge along the way. And so had you ever had that feeling that there was something you just had to do? It may not have been what you planned for your life. I was in retirement, I'll be honest with you, Jane. I was a true elder and had a couple of years of full retirement and this project came along. Well, you know, it doesn't end just because you get old enough to retire. Um, there's always work out there. So I had to come back into the fold and Atlantic Post Life Pipeline was one of those things that I didn't plan for but it planned for me. So we all heeded the call and we spoke out against this environmental injustices of the ACP. Well, then how did we get to the celebration? On July 5th, 2020, owners of the ACP, Duke and Dominion, announced that they were abandoning the project that was called the ACP. You know, I was in a grocery store when that happened and I couldn't jump up and down and yell because I think they might have called security on me. But um, it was one of those days of celebration. It was the second Independence Day of 2020. Of course, it could also be called the Inter Interdependence Day because so many of us worked together on that. And that's the only way we won was our interdependence. So it took a lot of strategies but I believe there was one important component that made the critical difference. In many ways, it was actually the environmental injustices of the proposed pipeline that were their very death knell. Uh, it strengthened our opposition as we came together across our differences. Thousands of individuals and organizations, often led by indigenous peoples, engaged in the campaigns against this monstrosity. These change makers saw something bad, unjust and unfair and found ways to get in its way. We got in its way through working together across our boundaries of class, race and gender, indigenous, black and other peoples of color, especially across those boundaries with new collaborations and mutual support. Now those alliances strengthened the case against the pipeline as well. We had to make our case heard, so we had to take it to the public. And it was obvious um, how targeted these communities were. Our victory didn't happen over tonight, overnight, but it was the commitment that was there for the long haul that took it, took it on and made it successful. And it was those who were most impacted that stepped up and stood out. I wanna give one little piece of information in that there were four tribes in North Carolina that were directly impacted, not just the Lumbee, it was supposed to end in our territory and we're the largest tribe, but it was the Kohari, the Halawasaponi, the Lumbee, and the Meharan. And we were consistent in our opposition, even in efforts to bribe us with million dollar payouts. Um, but we resisted those efforts to divide us. And we were joined with other allies who were impacted in protest, testimony, and perseverance. So we had to come together None of us were large enough as by ourselves. So what's next? Some of our work will move from protest to policy. You've kind of alluded to that a little bit. Uh, policies that are more inclusive, fair, and just for all. And I want to end by saying this wasn't the first time the Lumbee had and other indigenous peoples have had to fight. To name a few, in 1958, the Lumbee routed the KKK in what became known as the Black Battle of Hayes Pond. Now, while the Klan did not become extinct, it still exists, there has never been another rally or other action since 1958 in our territory. I'm giving notice here because then we also had to fight in the 80s, multiple efforts to uh, cite toxic and radioactive waste corporations that were wanting to dump these, their waste into our river. So we had to fight for our clean water and we did. And we have won every battle we took on. 
everyone. We didn't know what was going to happen with the ACP, but we had hope and courage that that would happen. So we're still 100%, and I want to let the world know that. But we're still fighting. We currently have a wood pellet plant, a plastics plant, and a liquefied natural gas facility coming on up that's on our plate to work against. All dirty industry. Now, it's an indicator of how our communities get targeted as well. So why am I celebrating? Because we are resilient caretakers of this earth. We have been given an awesome task by the creator and we have carried that task for millennia. We worked hard and with many others to defeat the Atlantic Coast Pipeline. And we celebrate that and all that came before. But now we move forward in victory and we, are, we say to those who look to come back that we are still here and we're not going anywhere. What we can't do by ourselves, we will do together. Thank you. Oh, Donna, thank you so much. You know, when you spoke um, last fall at the Fire Drill Friday in, in Washington, D.C., and you described what you were up against with the Atlantic Coast Pipeline, and we were all so worried. So for us, when, when we found out that you'd beat them, it was we announced it as, um, as good news on Fire Drill Friday. We were so, so happy, and, and I thought of you again. And I just, I want to thank you from all of us, and... Uh, Thank you for your tenacity and for your leadership and stay strong. Thank you. And now before I introduce our next guest, Jane Klebb from Bold Alliance, let's take a moment to watch a video that honors the many people behind the Keystone XL victory. Let's watch. Oh, no. officials are here to listen to you. I'm the sixth generation on this farm. We homesteaded during the Kincaid Act. Been a long time living there. That's our livelihood. Nebraska Farmers Union urges President Obama and Secretary Kerry to protect our nation's primary economic and environmental interests and deny the permit for the Keystone XL pipeline. And I'm here today as a voice and testament for what has happened to my community in Mayflower, Arkansas. I came all the way from North Carolina to be here. Join us and say no to KSL. The perception of moving away from fossil fuels appears to be large and daunting, but we undoubtedly have the ability, the intelligence, and the energy to meet this challenge. I hope Thank you. Speaker number 127. This is not about politics. This is about what is right for humanity. Our children, yours and mine, Mr. President, will curse us in 25 to 50 years. Question is, is he going to raise the heavy hand of big oil, or is he going to raise the hand and the spirits of the American people? When your bulldozers try to cross our line, every single person will be here saying no. Not in our land, not in our water, not in our country. Thank you. Wow. To tell us more about how people power has been shaping the fight against the Keystone XL pipeline, please help me welcome Jane Klebb. Jane's husband is a cattle rancher in Nebraska. Jane is the author of Harvest the Vote and founder of the Bold Alliance. She is the chair of the Nebraska Democratic Party and a board member of Our Revolution. Jane has a long background in organizing unlikely alliances in urban and rural communities. She's a key leader in the fight to stop the Keystone XL pipeline and is using those skills and strategies in a new project called the Pipeline Fighter Hub 
to help other farmers, ranchers, climate advocates, and tribal nations to protect the land and water. Welcome, Jane. Thank you, Jane. It's such an honor to be with you and to be with all the Greenpeace activists. You know, at Bold, we believe in the power of small but mighty, the local grassroots groups who are on the front lines every single day trying to stop risky fossil fuel projects. And that's exactly what we've done with the Keystone XL pipeline. It was a 10 year battle and it's literally still ongoing because President Trump keeps on trying to revive this project that we thought was dead. We created an unlikely alliance of farmers, ranchers, tribal nations, and climate advocates, both in rural communities and in urban cities, to all come together to say, we will not let a risky tar sands pipeline take land away from farmers, from tribes, and risk all of our water, also a bunch of big oil corporations can make money on the export market. We listened, we asked people to get involved, and we acted together. Whether those calls to actions came from John Quigley, who had the crazy idea of creating crop arts that were the size of 80 football fields that you could literally see from the sky in order to send messages to the world and to President Obama that we were here and we were gonna stop this pipeline. Or whether it was answering the call from Bill McKibben to go to DC and get arrested in front of the White House something that not a single farmer or many of our tribal allies in our rural communities ever imagined that they would do. Or whether it was answering the call from Dallas Goldtooth to get on horseback with Winona LaDuc in the streets of Washington, DC, where the Cowboy and Indian Alliance carried their brand flags and their tribal nation flags to the White House and took camp on the mall of the National, of the National Mall and put up teepees all to tell President Obama, we're here. And if you're not gonna come to Nebraska, South Dakota, or Montana to see our land that we're protecting, we're gonna bring our bodies to you. Or whether it was Mika C. Camp, who had a dream at the first spirit camp that we held along the Keystone XL route, where the elders and ancestors spoke to him in his dream, and they said, you must bring the Ponca sacred corn back to its ancestral land in Nebraska when they were forced to leave Nebraska on the Ponca Trail of Tears, that corn hadn't been planted in over 136 years. We planted that, land, that seed as medicine directly inside the Keystone XL pipeline route, which also is directly on the Ponca Trail of Tears. We've done that for the past six years, and it has created not only a movement to protect the land, but we've been able to spread that seed to other pipeline fights, including the ACP and in fights in Florida and all across the world. Casey Camp, Mika C's mom, dubbed the Ponca sacred corn seeds of resistance because the elders told Mika C in his dream that when we can't stand anymore, when we, we may feel tired from the fight, the corn will stand for us. So we have stopped this pipeline twice under President Obama. And we have it stopped right now because of lawsuits at the National Supreme Court and all along the route where we are fighting eminent domain in the infringement of the sovereign rights of tribal nations. But the only way that we can make sure that this pipeline is dead and gone forever is if all of us get out and vote for Vice President Biden. He's already made a commitment. He will reject the Keystone XL pipeline permit and he will also work to end fossil fuel projects. And I will tell you that Greenpeace is on the side with the frontline fighters. We've been saying for over a decade, we cannot continue to build fossil fuel projects and still pretend that we're climate advocates. This is about land justice when it comes down to it, not just climate justice, but land justice. The fact that 100 years ago, 15% of African Americans held agricultural land as farmers. And today, 100 years later, that is less than 1%, or the fact that farmers, ranchers, and tribes land continues to be taken by our government for their use for risky projects. That's what I mean when I say it takes all of us to get out and vote, and it takes all of us to be those seeds of resistance. When we have those hard days on the pipeline fights, because we always do, I always remind myself, when we organize unlikely alliances, we win. 
And I tell myself that over and over again. When we organize unlikely alliances, we win. When we organize unlikely alliances, we win. Let's get out there and spread those seeds of resistance. Oh, Jane, thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you for reminding us of the power of unlikely alliances. And thank you for the work that you do. And now before we hear from our next guest, Melina Labukan Massimo, let's watch a short film about how Melina brought solar energy to her indigenous community of Little Buffalo in Alberta, Canada. My name is Melina Labukan Massimo, the host of Power to the People, a new documentary series that discovers how indigenous peoples, values, and wisdom are leading the world towards a clean energy future. This is what an 80 panel top amount system solar project looks like. Energy transition, self-determination, food security, and what autonomous decision making looks like. This project was a project that came from a community because we're completely surrounded by fossil fuel extraction. But that's not something that we necessarily wanted. It was a foreign imposition. So Pitapan signifies a changing, a coming of a dawn back to empowering our people. I think we've got to think much more of our, about our food, where it comes from, and thank Mother Earth for her generosity. Thank the salmon and save the salmon. Yes, exactly. I'm really excited to go to other communities that have started doing this as well, whether it be solar, wind, geothermal exchange. I think there's a multitude of renewable energy systems that I have yet to learn about part of the Grand Renewable Energy Park, which is 249 megawatts. So this farm is 100 megawatts, where this wind you see behind is 149 megawatts. We see this is like really the energy transition that we're all really hoping for. These here are linden trees, and they're actually one of the few trees that we can eat the leaves. This knowledge is actually going to help us survive the era of climate change. So the time is now to continue to learn your traditions, learn your culture, learn how to incorporate new technology, but also teach others and take action. I'm excited to embark on this journey and bring everyone along with me. Watch us on APTN. Oh, Melina, I, I find that so moving. You told me a number of years ago that this was what you were gonna do and you've done it and I'm so proud of you. Melina Labukan Massimo is a Lubicon Cree from Northern Alberta and has worked on social, environmental, and climate justice issues for the past 20 years. Melina is the program director at Indigenous Climate Action, the founder of Sacred Earth Solar, and a fellow at the David Suzuki Foundation. She's also the host of a new TV series called Power to the People, which profiles renewable energy, food security, and eco-housing projects in Indigenous communities across Canada. Melina holds a master's degree in Indigenous governance at the University of Victoria. For over a decade, she worked as a climate and energy campaigner with Greenpeace Canada and the Indigenous Environmental Network internationally, campaigning and working on resource extraction and climate change in Brazil, Australia, Mexico, Canada, and across Europe. Melina also works on the issue of murdered and missing indigenous women in Canada after the suspicious death of her sister, Bella, whose case still remains unsolved. In 2017, she brought me and Barbara Williams to the Alberta tar sands in 40 degree below zero weather to help me learn about the horrific impact that the gigantic open mind is having on the surrounding communities and environment. Please welcome Melina Labukan Massimo. It's such an honor and privilege to be here with you today, Jane, and with everybody else on this um, amazing panel. And Jane, I just have so much love and respect for you, so it's so nice to see you again today. As I 
as I said in my language, um, my name is Melina Miwap in Lubokan Massimo, and I come from the Lubokan Cree Nation, which is north of the medicine line. Today I am calling in from the unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples. I was born in northern Alberta, as Jane mentioned, in a small Indigenous community called Little Buffalo, in the homeland of the community, uh, the homeland of the Lubokan Cree, which is my nation. We are located in the tar sands, which is one of the largest industrial extraction zones on the planet. And in the genesis of the KXL pipeline, the TMX pipeline, line three, and many others that extend like tentacles from our homelands. There's other pipelines I won't name here today except for one, but we have stopped them dead in their tracks um, over the years of campaigning, namely the Enbridge Northern Gateway pipeline and others that I won't name today because there's so much to celebrate. Um, but I, as I mentioned, I was born into a community from that was already actually fighting to protect Mother Earth and dispossession when I was born. My first blockade was at the age of seven when my community was blocking a newly built road into our territory that brought with it deforestation and oil and gas extraction. I've seen and experienced massive oil spills across Northern Alberta, and namely in 2011, right next to our community's homes was one of the largest spills in Canada's history. My family couldn't breathe, their eyes were burning, their stomachs were turning, the school needed to be shut down for, for weeks. This was one of the reasons why I chose to testify before the US Congress in 2012 to let them know about the detrimental impacts of the tar sands and why the KXL pipeline needed to be stopped. In Northern Alberta, we see tar sands mines the size of entire cities, and we see the ancient, pristine, beautiful boreal forest, the northern lungs of Mother Earth being decimated, fragmented, and scraped away for oil, gas, fracking, and tar sands. Never in my lifetime did I think I would witness such devastation to our land, our waters, our medicines, and our peoples. We are not only in an ecological crisis, but we are in a moral human crisis. All around the world, we see people's homes and traditional territories being turned into industrial landscapes. We see people fleeing their homes and becoming refugees because it is no longer safe to stay in their homelands. We see land defenders being murdered for standing up to protect our collective future. And we continue to see women being raped, violated and abused. These colonial values of domination are embedded in values of patriarchy. And this is why we continue to see the raping and pillaging of Mother Earth, as well as violence against women. The earth is our mother and violence against the earth begets violence against women. And as a sister and a family member of a murdered or missing indigenous woman, I can tell you that as indigenous people, not only are we standing up to protect the land, but we are fighting to protect the women all at the same time. So myself and other indigenous leaders spent years building a movement against the tar sands. Our elders signaled the alarm for us and we followed in their footsteps. We traveled from community to community, country to country, and protested at the AGMs, AGMs of company after company and met with countless investment firms and parliamentary officials across Canada, Europe, and the US to say the time is now to divest from fueling the climate change crisis and violating Indigenous rights and destroying our homelands. In, 20, in 2007, I remember it was such a joke to them of what we were asking, but that didn't deter us. We kept demanding, we kept speaking out, and after nearly 12 years of nonstop campaigning, we are seeing a multitude of oil and gas companies and investment firms pulling out of the tar sands, signaling to the world that, is no, that it is no longer business as usual in the tar sands. And I think this is an important victory to celebrate as a climate victory, though the fight is not over yet. The question that kept coming up to me over and over after the oil spill was, how do I build the future I want to see? And after years of campaigning, I knew I needed to start building climate solutions. I knew I needed to start building a yes to our no's. So in 2013, I started to fundraise and research how to bring about solar into my home community, where no one had actually ever seen solar panels. And by 2015, I built beside, alongside with my community, a 20.8 kilowatt system that powers our health center. It was one of the first indigenous led and community owned solar projects in the heart of the tar sands. And then I created an organization called Sacred Earth Solar, which continues to help fundraise and build solar projects for indigenous communities across Turtle Island. Through the work of Sacred Earth Solar, I've helped to solarize the tiny house warriors who are indigenous women, Sequetmic women, who are building tiny houses in the path of the Trans Mountain Pipeline. And also Sacred Earth Solar is now working with indigenous climate action to solarize cabins in Wet'suwet'en territory that are building cabins to protect, to protect their territory 
from fracked gas pipelines. This year, I also hosted and launched a TV series called Power to the People, which is currently airing on national TV here in so-called Canada. This show, which is the first of its kind, features Indigenous communities that have transitioned to renewable energy, have implemented food security projects, and have implemented eco-housing. We filmed in 26 locations coast to coast, but just so everybody knows, there are actually already over 2,300, 2,300 small to medium scale and renewable energy projects in Indigenous communities across the country and over 180 large-scale revenue generating projects in Indigenous communities that are literally getting communities 100% off diesel. These stories paint a picture of the future I want to see, the future that is here, the future that is now. So these are the pathways that exist, they already exist towards recovery, resilience, and preparedness. Many of them can be seen in the stories of Power to the People. They are also inspiring climate victories. And we need to celebrate these communities and their examples of leadership as they forge paths towards a just recovery. It is critical to support Indigenous people, in, sorry, it is critical to support Indigenous media so our peoples can speak for ourselves and tell our own stories, stories that have been silenced for far too long, stories that need to be here, heard, and stories that will heal the world. Colonial governments must stop bailing out the fossil fuel industry and instead implement innovative policies and legislation that hold climate criminals, criminals accountable and usher in a just transition. It is up to us to hold these governments and corporations accountable for our current planetary collapse. In order to continue to do this work though, we must implement regenerative practices, healing justice and decolonization in our movements. Every person is needed to fight climate change, to fight environmental and systemic racism and demand climate justice. Governments and corporations try to make us feel small, but we are not small, we are many and we are powerful. We have heard here today that it is the power of people, people power that brings about climate victories. Together, we must make the choice to continue to act to save our planet from climate chaos. But we must be united, we must be vigilant, and we must act in protection of all future generations. Hi, hi, thank you so much. Hi, yes, thank you. Yeah, all right. <laughs> Thank you so much, Melina, for that wonderful story. And thank you all for joining us. We've come to the end now of this rally. And if you haven't already, please text Jane to 877-877 and head to firedrillfridays.com slash volunteer and sign up to volunteer with us to build people power in the lead up to the election and beyond. Thank you so much to our guests today, Donna, Melina, and Jane and to all of you at home for joining. Stay safe, stay healthy, take good care of each other. I'll see you next time. Thank you. Right. Very good, very good. All right, yes, absolutely. Love you, Jane. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you for being a part of this community. Thank you. Stay tuned for more information on the next Fire Drill Friday. See you in September.